I think the epiphany that I had finally was that no epiphany was ever going to come. You are listening to the ODAT Chad podcast. My name is Arlena and I'll be your host. Today, my guest is Mishka Shibali, best-selling author, musician, Yale instructor, and cat dad. Hey friends, so happy you're hanging out with me today. Today, my guest Mishka is a true Renaissance man. He's a super prolific writer, talented musician, gifted writer with a touch of smart ass. What's not to love? But before we jump in, something Mishka said sparked a thought that I I haven't really been able to shake and and I realize it's something that we all need to focus more on in recovery, which is having fun. Recovery work can be really heavy and dark and it's really easy to get lost in that part. So while it's part of the journey, how about we balance it out with some ideas about how to cultivate more joy and excitement? So here's the deal. Before I give you some ideas about how to reconnect with things that you can do sober that are fun, I'll share some mechanics about the brain that will explain why some people have a hard time connecting to that feeling of fun early in recovery. So when we drink or do drugs or whatever our addictions revolve around, we are flooding our brain cells with dopamine, the chemical responsible for that happy feeling that we love so much. Brain cells actually have receptors that act like little funnels, allowing the dopamine to be absorbed. But the wisdom of the body is always trying to stay in balance. So over time, it will actually retract those receptors so it can't absorb so much. The result is the need for more alcohol or drugs to get that same effect. So uh, meanwhile, your hippocampus and amygdala, the parts of your brain responsible for memories and emotions are recording all of this and essentially rewiring your brain to depend on that stimulus. In totality, this is how your brain develops addiction, a dependence on whatever your drug is. When we stop drinking or doing drugs or whatever we're addicted to, you know, we are working with a diminished amount of receptors on the brain cells. We're not physically capable of actually absorbing the normal amount of dopamine that would be present prior to becoming addicted. Where in the past, we might enjoy spending time with friends or playing music or going dancing or working on a hobby. All these things now fall flat in early sobriety. We don't actually experience the fun part, but in reality, we can't, right? But here's the good news. Again, the body will restore itself to balance, but it takes a little time and effort to heal and rewire your brain. Those brain cell receptors do come back and so does the fun. So here are some tips for early recovery if you are worried that you'll never have fun again. I know that was my biggest worry when I first got sober. I'll never have fun again. I'm kidding. That was not my biggest thing, but you see what I'm saying. Um, But anyway, here are some tips. Number one, learn to love exercise. It's the fastest way to generate dopamine naturally. Um, Two, meditation. Meditation actually helps to rewire your brain and emotions back to normal. So that's the good news. And three, try new things. Um, New things won't have the burden of failing to live up to expectations, which might actually cause disappointment. And finally, number four, surround yourself with people who are happy and fun. And they say that we're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So if you're hanging out with a bunch of sad sacks, you will be too. Find some fun friends. And it's my experience that people in recovery actually are a lot of fun. We are the people who insist on enjoying life. So find some fun friends. I hope that gives you a new perspective and some encouragement to find you're happy again. So for an intro to today's episode, I spent some time with writer, musician, and Yale professor Mishka Shabali. He was very cool and very tall, I learned. Um, I'll tell you that we didn't get to cover half the things I wanted to. We left out his shipwreck story. I can't believe I let that happen, Um, but there was just not enough time. He pours it all out in his six best-selling Audible shorts, so definitely check those out along with his latest book, cold turkey, which you can actually get for free for the month of May. This guy has been through some really unusual and crazy experiences, and I can't wait for you to meet him. So with that, please enjoy and share this episode with Mishka. All right. Well, Mishka, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chad podcast. 
Thanks for having me. Do you happen to know what ODAT stands for? I have no idea. It stands for one day at a time. <laughs> I should have figured that out. You know, it's so funny. I When I named the podcast, I just assumed everybody in the recovery community knew what ODAT was. I have been mistaken. <laughs> I've made, I've made mistakes like that too, by just sort of assuming that people know stuff and people may, you know, make assumptions about me. My friends are all music nerds. And so we all assume that the other one, oh, you know, the misfits are like, oh, I never listen to misfits. It's like, wow. You know, everybody's got their know? Well, listen, yeah. we are here to educate. So <laughs> there you have it. I well, already listen, learned something. Already I know. Learned. There you go. Well, listen, I am super excited to talk to you. I know I say that all the time, but I truly am because you offer such a unique perspective to what I'm usually accustomed to talking about. Like you were able to get sober without doing any kind of program, rehab, or, you know, the 12 step, anything. So, Listen, it happens. It's I'm totally fascinated by that. And, and so I kind of want to dig into that. But listen, you are so prolific, an author, a musician. I mean, you got just your you have six best selling Kindle singles. That is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. I was on a real hot streak for a while there, just bam, 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 one after another, you know. And um, and yeah. you probably know this too, you know, that like when you when you live a life where you're not doing anything or making anything for a long time, and then you remove the primary obstacle, which for me was alcohol, then a lot of times it comes out very quickly under tremendous pressure, you know? It was like you were backed up and all your creativity just needed to come out. Yep. What's ironic too, is that when my editor approached me about writing for Amazon in the first place, he was like, oh, you should do this new thing. And I was like, well, I'm sober now, so I'm all out of stories. And, uh, <laughs> and My life is over. I, like, I have nothing to yeah. say. <laughs> he was like, you, you don't have one more story? Turns out I had a couple. So Yes, you did. Well, we'll have to dig into some of that. I've been enjoying your Audible. Where do we go? Is it a, is it a book and it's on Audible or... It's an Audible original, meaning it's like it's an audio book that was created exclusively for Audible. That's so cool. Yeah. My editor at Amazon and really my mentor as a, you know, as a writer moved over to Audible. And then he was like, why don't you do this book over here in this format? And, um, you know, I did, I've done audio books for all my stuff. I, I did it for my full length memoir. I did it for all my Kindle singles. And I've got really good feedback from people about having my damaged voice in their ear. <laughs> and I feel like tech, reading text sometimes can be impersonal. And mm-hmm. I wanted it to be like you're on a long car ride with a friend. And, uh, you know, the friend is just like, listen, this is why you need to quit drinking. All right. Yeah. Listen to me. You know, I wanted to, that sensation of having my voice in your ear. Well, I think that was the first thing I said to you. I was like, I feel like I've, we've been hanging out because I've been <laughs> listening to you talk to me for a while. I feel like we're yeah. friends already. <laughs> yeah, really good. And it's free for the month of May. Is that right? Yeah. One of the things I talk about in the book and, and one of the things I talked about, you know, too audible when we were talking, when we were getting this project rolling is that I, like, I really hate that addiction and recovery is such a multi-million dollar industry now, you know, and it seems to be in bad faith to me that people are sort of profiting off of other folks, pain and misery and suffering. So I honestly, I was really conflicted about, you know, about doing this project. And then they said, um, well, let's put it up for a month for free. And I was like, yes, that's, that's absolutely the way to do it. You know, so I'm trying to talk to everybody who I can right now and just get the word out so that it's not, listen, it's not a silver bullet. And I do think one of the things that we need in recovery is a lot of different voices from a lot of different viewpoints, because okay. obviously what I say isn't going to resonate with everybody. And, and one of the things that I'm trying to do is fill in the gaps where AA or 12 step programs don't, they don't speak to everybody. They don't work for everybody. They don't serve everybody. It's so true, hopefully yeah. I'm sort of filling in some of those gaps too, you know, but I just want to get it out there as a resource so that people have access to it for free. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for putting that out. I will leave links to it in the show notes. So we'll definitely, I'll post it on my Facebook page and all that stuff. So we'll, we'll do our part to get that out. That's super cool. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. 
So typically what I do is I'll spend the first half of the conversation sort of learning a little bit about your backstory. I'm always fascinated about pe- people's childhoods because I feel like that kind of sets the stage. We make a lot of decisions about ourselves, you know, from years zero to six, right? And yeah. it, it's almost as if we allow a, a child to decide who we are and what we should be as adults, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. But uh, maybe we could start with a little bit about what your parents did for a living and what your family of origin was like? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, my, my father was a rocket scientist. Which are you is serious? Interesting. <laughs> How did I miss that? <laughs> People are like, Oh, it's, that's a real thing. I thought that was just, you know, a, a punchline, right. but, uh, yeah, my dad was a, a physicist an electrical engineer, a rocket scientist. You know, he's a very, very smart, very brainy dude. My mom was a stay at home mom, which used to be a thing. The, uh, <laughs> And she was our uh, primary caregiver. She was the second of 17 children. And yeah, so she'd been a mom her entire life. She was the first person in her family to get a college degree. She was a photographer for the local newspaper when we were kids. And an interesting sort of notable thing is that she kept her maiden name. Which oh, um, at that time, yes, you know, in the seventies and particularly in Canada, both my parents are Canadian. I was born in Canada, oh, okay. uh, dual citizenship. That was a very sort of bold statement, you know. Wow. And I think when I was probably like five or six, I was obsessed with all sort of medieval Robin Hood stuff, <laughs> like the medieval Legos. Yeah. And I also I remember my parents taking me up. They, they were like going out one night. And they took us to see. There was this guitar player in a wheelchair, and he sang songs and told jokes. And I told my mom after seeing that show, I said, "Mom, I want to be a wandering minstrel." And she that's said, "Don't tell pretty your dad." Close to what I came up with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But uh, my mom's always been super supportive of anything and everything that I wanted to do, and my dad less so. <laughs> but yeah, so I don't I don't do a lot of physics or science stuff. My you know my sister got her degree electrical engineer, and I was always the like the guy who wanted to you know I was reading the New Yorker when I was a kid and like you know obsessing. You the New Yorker. Over. Yeah, when I was uh, when I was like sixteen or seventeen, my mom was like, well. The, you know, the best writing in the country comes out of the New Yorker. Oh. So she got me a subscription and I have my subscription to today. You know, oh. that was transformative for, for me to be exposed at that a young age, you know, and she was just like, you know, like you're an adult, here's the writing, you know. That's amazing. Did you always want to be a writer then? Well, I mean, aside from the traveling minstrel. Yeah. I wanted to be a musician, you know, Guns N' Roses was like my gateway drug with Chuck Berry, Guns N' Roses, Nirvana. I just, I wanted to like shred guitar. And then I got a guitar and figured out early on that shredding is hard. And I'm not particularly gifted as a musician. And my mom always said, you know, I think you'll end up being a writer. And um, yeah. And so she really, you know, there was, I think with many people, you don't figure out your path in life right away. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of dead ends. There's a lot of false starts. And for me, there's a lot of sort of like seesawing back and forth between being a musician, being a songwriter, playing in bands, and then sort of pursuing sort of academia and trying to be a quote unquote serious writer. But I sort of kept a foot in both of those worlds long enough now that I'm able to do both. And it's, it's tremendously fulfilling, you know, to have two mistresses like that, you know, it's like, you can go, I'll write until I'm sick of writing. And then I'm like, ah, screw this. I'm going to make a record. And then when I'm, when the record's getting frustrating, I'm like, ah, screw this. I'm going to go write something, you know, so I can sort of keep, stay creative without feeling exhausted with one discipline. Right. Without getting burned out. Yeah. I was just going to say that is, that's a um, creative discipline. I mean, they seem to go well together because when you're doing music, you're writing. And when you're writing, it's, you do have like a certain cadence. It seems like, you know what I'm saying? It's like when you have your voice and you're writing, there's like this cadence that comes when you're writing. Yeah. They absolutely, you know, songwriting and story. And I mean, writing is at its core, it's storytelling For sure. and many, many good songs, even if lyrically in their content, they're not telling a story. There's no narrative arc. There's a narrative arc in the music, you know, and uh, towards the end of the verse, you're like, oh, I think we're getting to the chorus. And then the chorus hits, and you're like, here's the chorus, you know, yeah, so there it. is. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, I, I teach a writing workshop at Yale in the summers, which of course, unfortunately canceled this year. Oh, but so sad. Yeah. 
one of the first things I do in the first class is, you know, I tell a dirty joke and I say, listen, is it I'm the gonna, same joke? The same joke every year. It's what incredible. is it? All right, you, all right. This is my favorite joke of maybe all time. Oh my God. I'm so right? excited. So there's the, and this is, listen up because this is everything that I have to teach anyone about writing. Okay. Uh, look, free little writing lesson right here. So, so excited. The, um, so there's a fur trapper way up north in the wilds in Canada in the, in the winter. And there's a knock on the door. And he's like, man, who could be knocking my door? And he goes to open the door. There's another fur trapper there. The guy says, man, so good to see another human being. Like, come on in, you know? And the guy says, well, I can't stay. I just, um, I just wanted to swing by. I wanted to invite you to a party tomorrow. And the guy says, a party? Man, that sounds, that sounds fantastic. I haven't seen another human being in months. The guy says, well... I got to warn you, there's going to be, there's going to be some people drinking. And he says, Oh man, I, I haven't had a taste in months. That, that sounds fantastic. And he says, well, I got to warn you, there's, there might be some people fighting. And he says, Oh, you know, maybe when I was a younger man, but now, you know, I'll just, I'll steer clear. And he says, what well, last thing I got to warn you about, there's going to be some people making love. Says, oh man, this, this party sounds incredible. You know, uh, he says, well, what should I wear? The other guy says, ah, don't matter. It's just going to be me and you. (laughs) So it's, it's a messed up joke, right? Because this is the thing is that joke. It's about, it's about alcoholism or it's about alcohol. It's about desperation. It's about rape. It's about, uh, about you know, bleakness. It's about human darkness. It's about all these horrible things. But when I tell that joke, everybody laughs. Yeah. And the reason that it's funny is because you un, you exposit the correct information in the correct order. Mm. If the guy says at the beginning, I'm going to invite you to a party that's just me and you, and then I tell you the rest of the stuff, there's nothing there, you know? Yeah. So, and that's, you know, the point I make to my students is that it's all about um, giving people the right information at the right time to mm. construct this narrative arc. And if you do so skillfully enough, you can take the darkest stuff in the world and make people laugh with it. You know, yeah. so that joke is like just incredibly well written. Absolutely. Did you write it? Oh, hell no. That's, <laughs> that's, I think I heard that on a fishing trip from my uncle, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And I was like, I got to remember this one. So, oh, that's you know. interesting. A joke that your uncle told you, was it just you and him? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is yes. this, have we reached the root of your drinking issue? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, that is, and I think he told it with a twinkle in his eye too, like just going to be me and you. And I was like, ah, <laughs> everyone's got that uncle, uncle diddly. <laughs> creepy uncle. <laughs> creepy uncle. I do not have that uncle. I just want to state for the record. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I feel like, uh, and listen, I, I love writing and it's so interesting when I don't know if you've had this, ex- I'm sure you've had this experience, but sometimes when I write and the channel is clear and I'm just coming from an honest, pure place, when <laughs> this is going to sound terrible, sometimes when I'm writing, and I'm usually writing about recovery stuff, and so when the tears come, that's when I know it's it's pure. You know what I mean? Do you have you yeah. had that experience when you're writing and you just like it brings stuff up for you and you're just like. Oh my God. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, um, you know, I was writing fiction and I was like, there was a story where I was like, Oh, this, I, I need to kill the dog. The dog needs to die. And I was like, I, I can't, no, I can't do it. I just, I had to like tap out on the story. Cause I was like, I can't, I've created can't this kill. dog oh, in the story. Love dogs, I, huh? I do. I do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, you know, there are many times, you know, writing my memoir, writing a story, I would, um, you just sit there in front of your computer and cry. You know, and that counts. That's part of the work. You know, the, when a woman's pregnant, she's not giving birth for nine months for nine months, that baby's growing. Right. So the work is, is happening. (laughs) Um, And, but you know, you don't see any sort of physical product until the last, whatever, 12 to 36 hours. And then ta-da, there's a baby, you know, but there's, a you know, so I find that there's a lot of, front end loading of the work when it comes to writing, particularly when it's nonfiction, particularly when it's memoir, particularly when it's about recovery. And some of that work is staring at a blank page and hating yourself. And some of that work is sitting there crying, you know? 
Um, but sometimes you have to, uh, it takes a while sometimes to get there, to get into that sweet spot. But also, yeah, when you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're crying when you're writing something that proves that it's, you know, it's like, um, it's a certain frequency that, you know, that you'll hit that will make the glass rattle. You know, and that's when you're sort of, you found that frequency that makes other things move. You know? Yeah, I find that it doesn't happen as often as I would like it to, but it's pretty cool when it does. You can have all my crying in front of the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick of it. I've had enough. I'm of it. sick of it. I'm, well, I'm getting ready to pitch the next piece. And I was just like, oh, man, I, I, no, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to think about this anymore. I don't, you know. you like, but I have processed and I don't need to do it anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, let me take you back just a little bit to, you know, like when the, when did the drinking start? I started drinking uh, seriously when I was probably uh, maybe 13, maybe tw- like maybe 12, 12 or 13. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a big kid. So I looked a lot older and um, you were you like know, big as in you were tall. Yeah, I um I'm I'm six five now and I've probably been this height since I was fifteen or sixteen. Wow. So I was yeah, so I got I got real big real fast. Um that's young and, to be that tall. Yeah. The um and that you know, and that's one of the things like, you know, with my my nephew, uh he just turned eighteen and he's like six seven, six eight. He's you know, he's huge. Wow. Um Your people we have to remind rich. ourselves that he's young you know, that he's right. still a kid. Um, but yeah, I, I started, um, I, we were, we had moved from, we'd moved from Canada to New Mexico to New Hampshire. And I was miserable in New Hampshire. We were all miserable there. We all hated it. And alcohol just, you know, as soon as I sort of, you know, finally got somebody to, to get me some, um, I was like, man, this is it. This is the thing. This is like, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. This is my calling right here. Like I'm, you know, this is, uh, I understand. This is, this is medicine. This is magic. This is everything that I, I need to be. And, um, you know, and sort of from that first drunk, I think I had like a six pack of, uh, bud tall boys. And, uh, my mom called the cops looking for me cause I was like out all night. And, um, the, you know, and as soon as I'd sort of gotten a taste there, then I was like, yeah, that's, this is it, you know, and I'll do sort of everything and anything that I have to in order to get more. Mm -hmm. Um, then after my, after my sophomore year of high school, I left early. I went to college, uh, when I was 15. Um, You went to college at 15? Yeah. Which, uh, smarty pants. (laughs) Well, some smart people are also incredibly dumb. And I was sort of a check in both of those boxes. Wait a minute. I got I to ask you something. So, I mean, I raised two teenage boys and one's graduated from high school. And, I mean, they don't let you graduate early unless you can, like, place out or, I mean, what do you got to do to graduate that much earlier? Well, so I never graduated high school. I, um, I applied to... I took my PSATs mm. and then I tested well. And then I got something in the mail, you know, um, it was like a small college in Massachusetts called Simon's rock. And there was, you know, and the flyer came in and said, Oh, you could, uh, you know, you could leave high school after two years and start, uh, you know, a college level program. Wow. And I had a similar response to that, that I did to alcohol where I was like, fuck yeah, this is it, man. This is my ticket out. You know, did you I hate hated high school? school. Oh, I hated it. I hated it. I was, um, I had like gotten in enough fights by that point that the next time I got into a fight, I was going to get expelled. And, um, who was provoking these fights? Are you, were you just a target because you were so big? I was a, tar- I mean, I was, I was a smart ass and I had a mouth, um, <laughs> but also there was, you know, moving there from New Mexico to New Hampshire, you know, the Northeast is very, things are a certain way. There are a specific way there. And if you're from there, then it all makes sense. Um, and everything else seems, seems weird, but if you're not from there, it seems bizarre. And I was sort of like young enough and hard headed enough that I was just like, you know, fuck it. I don't, I, I'm not going to do things the way the, like the stuff that you guys think is important is, you know, it's bullshit to me. And so I, you know, sort of alienated a lot of people from that. And then I just, um, I think it was high, you know, I've been picked on a lot throughout my life, but in high school, it's when I finally learned to you know, that it hurt less 
to lose a fight than it did to not fight. Mm. <laughs> and um, so then I started fighting back. And uh, I, I was not the aggressor. I'm, I'm not a bully. I've never been a bully. But when somebody pushed me or called me a name or picked on me or whatever, um, I would respond, you know. And so, yeah, so I, I left, um, I left high school when I was 15. I never, um, I never ended up getting my high school diploma. I went to Simon's Rock for two years in Massachusetts. And um, the first semester I was there, there was a school shooting. One of my classmates got a, got an, an assault rifle and oh. shot six people, killed a classmate of ours, killed one of our teachers. Um, and the next day I went home and found out that my parents were getting a divorce. And oh my God. if, if I had already been hard headed and nihilistic and sort of headed down the wrong path, that really kicked my ass, man. You know, yeah. um, that's, that's a lot to put on a 15 year old kid. Oh, 15. That's a lot. Were yeah. you at school when that happened? Yeah. Yeah. I, the, um, you know, the kid who got the rifles on my basketball team and I oh saw God. him that night and. You know, I ended up testifying in his murder trial when I was 16. Oh, he survived it? Yeah. Uh, he's doing life in prison in uh, Massachusetts. Oh, jeez. Yeah. He's been locked away for, Jesus, 25 years now. That's a long time. Six people, yeah. huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. That is so sad. I can't imagine what that must have done to you at that young age of just feeling so. Um, and then your parents the following week. Yeah, it, wow. uh, the next day, it was, I'm sorry, uh, it was the next day. Yeah. The, the shooting happened on December 14th, 1992. And then I stayed up all night. My mom came to get me and then, you know, drove us home. And I found out the next day by reading a letter that I wasn't supposed to, that my parents were oh. divorce. And, wow. uh, so that was, you know, that was incredibly hard. And, you know, and events like that to have, you know, sort of a one, two punch like that, that shit has a really long tail, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that I've, um, you know, I think I've dealt with the shooting. I've dealt with, you know, with the murders um, because I went and wrote about it in my mm -hmm. book and because I sort of had, you know, I got in touch uh, our friend Galen who got, uh, who got murdered. Um, I, I have a relationship now with his father that, you know, from writing about um, the shooting and writing about what it was like to live through that. And his father was a writer. His father's an incredible writer. Wow. So um, that I think helped me process that stuff. I don't know that I'll ever get over my parents' divorce and I'm okay with that. Um, I think guys get a lot of way, with, get away with a lot of horse shit that they shouldn't. Um, so how I'm, do you, how do you mean? Uh, my, you know, my dad came from a very sort of chauvinistic, misogynistic family. And then that was passed down to our, us kids, not in an overt way, but in a, um, a subtle way so that even my, my sisters internalized it. My mom internalized it, you know, sure. that, um, I got treated differently than, mm. than they did when we were kids. And then now, even as adults, you know, I get treated differently we all, all of us working together have to be sort of like, Hey, wait, no, that's, that's not right. You know, it has to be the other way. Mm. Um, How many but, of you are there? Uh, there's my older sister, Tatiana, me and my younger sister, Tashina. Okay. You're the middle child. Yes. And, um, you know, in recovery, in therapy, people really put a lot of emphasis on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I think forgiveness is incredibly important. And I think, um, for, you know, somebody said, you know, when you forgive someone, you're, you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really get that until I got to, um, forgiveness, but, but I think it's okay to keep a little bit of anger, resentment, um, in your heart and remember um, how it hurt, remember why it hurt, remember how much it hurt. And then when you're talking to your teenage son or one of their friends or random other kids or other people who have been through stuff, then you have a, you're able to go right back there and be like, man, 15, huh? Yeah. Shit. I remember what that was like. That's a right. rough ride, yeah. you know? And also, you know, I mean, I want to, I want to remember the ways in which my father let my family down. 
so that when I catch myself doing the same stuff or similar stuff, I can be like, whoa, hit the brakes, buddy, because mm-hmm. you know that doesn't fly and especially doesn't fly when it comes to you, you know? Right. Pain is a great that. teacher. Yeah. Yeah. But also, it's a great conduit to connect to people sometimes, too. So I get that. I get what you're saying about it's okay to keep it, keep some of it. It's a universal language. Yeah, right. Well, it's not like we can be without it, right? I mean, that's, you know, life is sometimes walking walking through a river of shit. I mean, it's like, it's just rough, right? There's a lot of negativity coming at us. So yeah. Okay, so you started drinking young. When do you feel like you got it? Like, did it escalate quickly to the point like we were blacking out and all that stuff early? Or yeah, the I you know I was sort of like throwing up and blacking out, getting into trouble, um, pretty you know sort of right away, and uh, and I was like drinking cough syrup and like just doing you know doing all kinds of dumb shit. Um, but when I was seventeen is when I re- I was on the bus on the way back from we had moved to Colorado at this point. I was going to the university of Colorado and I was on my way back from the bus or from, I was on the bus on the way back from classes and I was mortally hungover. Where I was like, my life may end from this hangover where I was like feeling every cell in my body, just in tremendous pain. And then I thought about the half gallon of like plastic jug whiskey that I had in, in my, you know, in, in the basement where I lived and Thinking about, and as, as poisoned as I was in that moment, thinking about alcohol, it, I, I started salivating like a dog. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I felt like I was going to get a boner on the bus. I just, I was like, oh my God, like feeling this terrible, just thinking about that and having a drink, you know, as soon as I walk in the door, I'm going to open the door. I'm going to go right down the basement. I'm going to grab the bottle. I'm going to take a drink, you know, thinking about that got me so excited in every way possible. I was like, I think I have a problem here. You know, and I was thinking about that movie alien, you know, where they bring the, you know, they sort of of get too close to the egg and then he gets the thing on his face and then they bring it back onto the ship, you know? And I was like that I, you know, that's what I did. Um, series of bad decisions. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You know, but also I think I recognized that 17 that I was an alcoholic and like continued to drink 15 more years, you know, wow, 15 more years. Yeah. What made you decide to stop drinking? Man, I don't know. In the moment, maybe six or seven years after I'd gotten sober, nothing, there was no bad thing that happened. That, you know, there was no like car accident or something like that, where I was like, okay, this is a new low. Like now I have to have to stop. I have to quit because I'd had all these bad things happen to me and just kept rolling, just kept rolling. But then I think, you know, in retrospect, I think my, I was playing bass with a band. We went over to the UK to do a tour. I was drunk the entire time. And then on the plane back, I just remember like all my bandmates were sleeping and I remember getting up and going and sort of like stumbling back to the, um, the flight attendants who were trying to sleep and being like, oh, the boys want another round and getting like five more glasses of wine and then going and sitting there and drinking all of them and then going back and saying another round for the boys, you know, wow. and, um, and I just, and I couldn't get there. I couldn't get drunk. I couldn't get to the point where I could relax enough that I could sleep. And, um, I think the epiphany that I had finally was that no epiphany was ever going to come. Wow. It's, it's just sort of like you're fishing in the same river all day long. And then finally, at one point you're like, there's no fucking fish in this river, man. I got to go home, you know? And I I realized that like there was going to be no lightning bolt from God, just that my life was going to get sadder and smaller and weaker and more pathetic and more corrupt until I was like, you know, 55, you know, as working as a bar back, Mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and I was just like, fuck that, man. That's like, that's not, it's not what I came to. I was uh, living in New York at the time. And I was like, that's not what I came to New York for. I'm not just going to throw my life away. I have shit to do. I got, I, I got to do it. And, and that's sort of, that's when everything changed. You know, at that point I was like, 
not just unemployed, but unemployable. Right. Yeah. 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 And so did you just quit cold turkey? Is that how it went down? Yeah. I, I came back from that tour and uh, got back to my apartment, slept hard, woke up, and then I was just done. You know, and it was um, it was pretty miserable for a couple of days and then off and on pretty miserable for three weeks and then off and on pretty miserable for, you know, six months, you know, like there would, you know, I'd have sort of good days or a, a good part of a day. And then it was like the bottom would just fall out and I would just be like, ah, fuck this. What's the point? You know, it's, you know, just sort of shaking with fury or panic attacks or whatever, or. But, um, you know, I, I think two months into it, I was like, I had some fly out dates in Colorado. So I was going to fly out to play this festival. And I was like, well, I, I have to drink when I'm there because that's what I do. I drink and play music, you know? And so I flew out there and got shit faced the entire time, humiliated myself, fucked a bunch of stuff up Mm -hmm. and then came back again and was like, okay, now I'm really done. Um, so it's, you know, in the, in the like lifetime movies there, you know, there are, it's always, um, you know, the, the sort of corrupt alcoholic has this one striking moment and then they're like, I'm done. And then they never drink again. And (laughs) that's the movies for you. Yep. And you and I know that for most of us, it's not a smooth process like that. You know, you make up your mind to quit and, you know, nine short years later, you actually do it. Yeah. It's so interesting because um, I've been having conversations lately where we talk about how the beginning of recovery is a series of failures and it's hard to believe in yourself if you're constantly failing. Right. It's like, then what happens? Like, how do you get, how do you find recovery if you don't believe in yourself? But what I've seen is that uh, like what happened for me was that I, Saw, I surrounded myself with people who were ahead of me and changing my environment was huge and, and filling my mind with a lot of really good information was helpful. Um, you, you know, a reliance on a higher power uh, was also very helpful. Do you have any kind of, uh, did you grow up religious or do you have like a higher power or what's, what's your concept of? My, my family's all, uh, or my, my mother's family, um, all pretty hardcore Catholic. Uh-huh. Uh, we didn't really get any of that or we only got it. Um, I feel guilty about everything, okay. but I don't, I never read the Bible or went to church. I just feel guilty about everything. So all right. I, I think that's the, the human condition. The guilt. I just didn't get any of the, like, you know, any of the culture, but, all right. um, I, uh, I've never, never believed in God when I was, you know, when I was six, I like six around that age, maybe younger. I walked out into the driveway. I remember because it was like summertime. I was wearing my little green running shorts. I don't think I was wearing anything else. I walked out. I looked up at the sky and I was like, nah. And just never. And since then, I, I've never had a moment where I was like, oh, there is a God. You know, actually, that's not true. I, I smoked DMT a couple of years ago. <laughs> and having been a lifelong committed atheist, um, when I smoked DMT, I came out of it and I was like, I get, I guess I have to identify as agnostic now because that was such a transformative experience yeah. that I, I can't pretend to know that there's no God, okay. you know, the, I, I'll just say that I don't know. Um, yeah, that's fair. The, um, but spirituality is not part of my program. I don't, I, I, I love this idea of higher power. I didn't come around to it until recently the last couple of years but i really love it you know and i was talking to a couple friends of mine who were in the program and they were like it doesn't have to be god it just has to be something that's that's greater than you you know i was like man i can think of a million things you know like dogs like rock and roll running you know my family um even just you know sometimes you make eye eye contact with a stranger or something and there's like a moment of connection and Mm -hmm. of just like oh you understand each other you know Mm -hmm. and all those things are greater than me but I don't think that um, – I think that's a useful tool for us to negotiate, sober or not, alcoholic or, or addict or not. The concept of higher power like that is a useful tool for navigating a world like the one we're living in right now sure. where everything seems like death and darkness and doom. 
mm-hmm. you know, I see my cat playing with a twist tie and I'm like, man, she fucking loves that thing, you know, and that's like a higher power right there, you know, and yeah. it gives you, it gives you an opportunity to just get out of that cycle of negativity. Yeah. But um, for me, there was never any sort of like let go and let God, that kind of thing. It was, I was just like, this is a problem that you've created and you're going to get unfucked up the same way you got fucked up, which mm-hmm. is on your own power. Um, okay. You know, and you have, cause it's been more than 10 years now, right? Yeah. Yeah. It'll be, um, it'll be 11 years in May. I, I don't remember. I have the exact date written down on my calendar, but I keep forgetting. And I feel like that's a good sign to keep forgetting. <laughs> like, yeah. I forget your sobriety date enough that you have to put it on the calendar. I've been uh, sober 26 years and I celebrate that shit. Like it was. <laughs> wow. That's, that is a huge well, because you know why, though, Mishka, is because there was a time when I couldn't make it till noon without a bong hit. You know what yeah. I mean? And I was a binge drinker, so I wasn't like a daily drinker, but I remember not being able, I, I remember feeling completely powerless to say no. Or mm-hmm. once I started, I had no off switch. Like as soon as I use any kind of drink or drug, it's just more. I just need more. Yeah. Crazy amounts of more. The, um, and this is the thing is, you know, and I don't say that about my sobriety date as a, a judgment or anyone else. I think we need to take every opportunity we can in this world to mm-hmm. celebrate positivity in a positive fashion. So I absolutely oh applaud you, you know, having that day, you know, a gold star on that day. You know, <laughs> yeah. For me, I'm, I'm just like so busy you know, I'm so busy with shit and working from home. And then especially now, like during the pandemic, we're like, is, is it Wednesday? Is it Sunday? Oh my (laughs) God. The day is running into the next. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, but uh, I think there, I think there is value in what you're saying about not being so tied to a specific date. Cause that's the other thing about, um, and you listen, I'm indoctrinated into, you know, 12 step programs and I love it, whatever. And it worked for me. I am very clear, very clear that it does not work for everyone. And there is like, there's a bunch of different programs out there and there's no programs and people, you know what I mean? It's like, I have no judgment how people get sober. I I just am rooting for the person who wants to feel better. You know, it's like, how can we support, how can we support you? It's like, I, I, who cares how? Yeah. The, you know, and and that's, it was actually, two things I talk about, you know, in, uh, in cold Turkey, you know, one is, is to say, um, that AA is a way that I support and every single person who's getting help in AA or NA or any 12 step program, whatever works for you. I, if it's working, I support you. Mm -hmm. If cleaning carpets is your therapy, if that's, what's keeping you sober, go clean a carpet for me. You know, I think whatever works, works, you know, but I have met a lot of people over the years who are like, oh, I could never go to AA. And for me, you know, I mean, I was happy to endure the worsening horrors of my alcoholism rather than, you know, go (laughs) to an AA meeting. So, you know, this, this book is targeted at people who have resistance to AA. Okay. And, um, you know, and where they feel like they won't go in there or they can't get the help they need there. Um, you know, and while I was sort of writing it, I was like, you know, some of my best friends, some of my, my greatest teachers in my life, like the people who um, I don't really call people in the middle of the night anymore. But if I did, these are the people I would call. Right. Uh, they're, you know, they've been in the rooms for 10, 15, 20 years. You know, they're they, so I have so much love and respect for people in the community. But, you know, we're all individuals. There's no, every fingerprint is unique, you know, and there's no one solution that works for everybody. So, you know, this is just me throwing out what worked for me and hopefully other people will chime in with, this is what worked for me. This is what worked, you know, and you just have more solutions. And a big thing for me, people always write to me and they're like, well, how do I quit drinking? And it's like, well, you know how you just, don't drink, right? It's easy. It's just, you don't do the thing. But the question that they're really asking is what do I do instead of drinking? Like how, how do I fill that hole in my life? Once you do stop, what the, what the hell do you do with your life? You Mm -hmm. know? And that's where, so I talk about the big life 
And that's why I always forget my sobriety date or I'm like, oh, I have to set a reminder on my phone or I'll, or I'll be like, oh, shit, it was three days ago. I should put a tweet out there so I can get some likes, you know, the the um, is because I have a big life. You know, I, I always have a million things going on, projects that I'm doing. And, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm trying to finish two EPs. I'm doing a, like a bunch of different repairs around my house or my mom's house. Sorry, what's an EP? Oh, uh, it's a uh, extended play. It's like a uh, shorter than an LP. You remember oh. it. <laughs> music. Yeah. One of your music, yeah. music projects. Okay. It, so it's like, it's shorter than an album. An album is basically like 10 tracks and an EP okay. is usually like six tracks. So I'm Got doing it. sort of two different ones. And then doing a ton of podcasts right now. And I have another, I'm working on a screenplay, you know, okay. and, and also, you know, I have, um, I have great friends. I hike with my friends. I run with my friends. I build guitars with my friends. I have this piece of shit old 1978 Datsun pickup that I'm restoring with a with a buddy. Those are all things that prevent me from drinking. You know right. that like I couldn't relapse today because I have so much shit to do and so right. much shit I want to do tomorrow. Right. I hear yeah. that a lot. A lot of people are like, oh, if I get sober, I remember thinking that too. I was 25 when I got sober and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do for fun? And it sounds like, <laughs> I think a lot of people struggle with that in the beginning and you know, what am I going to do for fun? So you have a lot of creative projects and you work really hard. What do you do? What is actually fun for you? I mean, work is fun for me. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of sort of armchair psychologists are like, Oh, you just, you know, replaced your addiction to alcohol with an addiction to work. Well, everybody in my family is like that. You know, I, yeah. I, I call my sister, she's not an alcoholic. She's not in recovery for anything. Uh, I called my sister the other day and um, we were talking and she was like, what's that clanking sound? I was like, oh, I'm washing the dishes, you know? And then she was breathing weird. And I was like, are, are you okay? And she's like, Oh yeah, no, I'm just, I'm doing my crunches while I'm talking to you. You know, so <laughs> Always like, multitasking. Yeah. And you know, when I go to see my mom, she's like, Oh great. While you're here, you know, we'll go and let's go pull the weeds and then we can talk and catch up. <laughs> you know, so it's like, yeah. Yeah. That's, that is, you know, my, my parents were, were both farm kids, you know, and you're working from, you know, from sunrise oh, until sundown. Yeah. And, um, and I like doing stuff, you know, Yeah. but for you to say that, I'm so grateful that you said the word fun, because I think fun is an integral part of any successful recovery program. We have to enjoy our time on this earth, you know, and, uh, my cat, she helps me so much with that because I can't explain to her, Elsie, I have, I have an interview in 15 minutes. I got to change my shirt and put on, you know, deodorant. You know, because she won't understand. She's just like, she's like, no, when I do this thing, then you rub my tummy. That's how it works. And I'm like, okay, I got three minutes here. Let's, <laughs> you know, okay. Let's just, you know? I've been watching yeah. Elsie in the background occasionally. <laughs> yeah. The, she, she, she's not there um, now, but she was. The, um, well, she's, she's over here right now. Oh, she's, okay. She moves around. Where's she's, your dog? So, do you have a dog? I don't have a dog and that, I always felt like that was a failure of mine because when I was on tour, like my, my Instagram stream would just be all pictures of me with other people's dogs. Cause I, I loved dogs when I was a kid. And then I adopted this stray in our neighborhood and took care of her like the last six months of her life. Oh, sweet. And, and it's like, <laughs> it's like finding out in your forties that you're gay. You know, I like my, I lived my entire life as a dog guy and yeah. just to find out now that I'm a cat guy, like it's just, it, I turned my world on its head. You well, know? you don't have to choose by the way, just FYI. This is true. So, so yeah. I, you know, I'm, there's uh, that, there's that alcoholic it, black and white thinking. <laughs> the, um, but my, my cat too, she's, uh, she's special needs. She, um, her like brainstem didn't form fully. So she walks around all the time like she's drunk. Like she, mm. her, she's, her, her head sort of hangs off to the side. Like she didn't really believe you. <laughs> and uh, she has a hard time like jumping up onto the couch or like getting up oh, to the bed baby. and stuff like that. So yeah, the, she, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, for when I first got her, when she was a kitten, she couldn't figure out how to use the litter pan without falling down into her shit. And that was, I was like, Oh God, what have I done? You know, <laughs> we got through that. She figured it out. And yeah, she's, 
she's such a great lesson mm-hmm. for me because she forces me to, to just to slow down, to be present, to have fun, yeah. to 43 years old, covered in bad tattoos, you know, six foot five. And I'm like running around in the yard with my cat, like getting her to chase me and chasing <laughs> You're me. frolicking in the yard that, with that your feline. That shit is good for you. doesn't matter who you are. It's yeah. good for you. It's powerful. No, an- animals are so amazing in recovery. I mean, they're, yeah. they're such just unconditional love. And I, and I think when at, at a time when we don't love ourselves, it's so important to have that experience of unconditional love. So I totally get that. For yeah. sure. I can't but, believe I waited this long to get a pet. You know, I was were like, you just traveling the whole time and just were not able to? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, first I was living in New York and having an, a, a, any kind of pet in New York is just kind of inhumane. And then I was just on tour constantly. And then, you know, when I fell in love with this stray cat, then I was, that sort of pried my heart open a little bit. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, well, maybe I could get a cat, you know? And then, um, and then when I got Elsie, I was like, Fuck it. I'm never touring again. All tours are canceled. <laughs> All tours are canceled. I just got to stay home with my cat, guys. Sorry. That's right. Sorry. COVID. Can't travel. Got to stay here. Though. <laughs> yeah. It's been the best thing that ever happened to you. <laughs> She's happy. She's delighted. Every, you know, every yeah. morning she, she does this thing where in the morning where she, you know, they've got a little cat paws and then she just will stick out one claw and just poke me like, yo, hey, wake up. <laughs> that is adorable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. so cute well listen gosh i i so enjoyed our conversation i want to be respectful of your time i know your your buddy is gonna come knocking on your door any minute um, yeah yeah but listen you have so many resources if obviously everyone's gonna have to get cold turkey right because yes. that'll be amazing cold turkey is free with uh with a paid audible subscription i have a couple of other free download code. So if you're not a paid audible member and you're struggling and you need a code, just drop me a message and I'll hook you up. That is amazing. Listen, your story is so needed and thank you for being so willing to talk and, and be that representative of like, Hey, you know, you can struggle with these things and there's, there's a multitude of ways to do this. So find the right, it seems like the message is find the way that works for you. So Absolutely. thank you so much for sharing your story. I feel like I said, I feel like we've been hanging out with friends already, but uh, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for your story. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Okay. You have a great day. Say hi to your friends. <laughs> All right. Take All right. care. Bye-bye. Bye. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.